Welcome to Startup Simplified Nyko. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making time. Uh, I'm very glad that you agreed very quickly. Yeah. So I think we're going to have uh, an interesting session yeah. uh, for our listeners. Okay, so let's let's just uh, let's just give a quick intro to our listeners. Uh, in your own words, uh, whichever way you want to uh, wanna introduce yourself, uh, let's get started with that. Yeah, so uh, my name is Nair Kovicaksano. So I'm a co-founder of Algorithma. Uh, we've existed since 2017. Uh, founded with the vision to democratize this data science skill across Indonesia. And that was a vision that was very, very important to me and to my co-founder because Back in uh, 2016 to 17, when I brought in plug and play from the United States and invested in 11 startups, almost all of them have trouble and data processing capability or data analytics. So I saw that this is also something that I had gone through when I was uh, doing SeekMe in 2015 and 16. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the talent it was is the talent potential are there, but. Um, this the rescaling is not yet quite there, right? Sure. So this is why, and and when we when we did a bit of research, we also realized that there's quite a bit of gap, not just in Indonesia but across the region. So sure, immediately we found there's a problem there that that we can that's quite big enough that we can actually uh, solve. So I had I had passion in education, my co-founder as well. So that's why we decided to just go and go with it and try it out. We had a lot of doubts, man. Like a lot of people were saying like, are you sure Indonesians, they're going to, you know, they're going to learn this? This is not an easy thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And we just went and we tried the first six months, uh, trial and error, trial and error. And finally, we got a lot of uh, pickup rates uh, in 2018 when a lot of people started signing up in public mm-hmm. and corporates as well. I think then we realized that, you know what, there's a lot more potential. We need to dig deeper and deeper and we decided instead of going horizontal broad with multiple courses, we go very deep into data because that's what I can see the defensibility is. From the get-go, I already told my co-founder that, look, I think this business is probably going to be more like five, six years kind of business before it becomes Red Ocean. (laughs) Just like in the U.S., you know, like Uh, Def Bootcamp and that thing. So we, from the get-go, we already knew that we need to build some strong defensibility and competitive advantage, you know, and, and by going deeper and building upon the, the depth of knowledge and expertise and quality, that's where we can have defensibility. Okay, let's, before, before we get deeper into uh, algorithm and what you guys are doing, let's, let's, just, let's just go a few years behind, right? Let's, let's talk about uh, where you grew up, uh, where did you study? Yeah. And uh, your initial career, because you have a very contradicting career, yeah. uh, if I may say, yeah. right? Uh, you've been on the uh, you've been on the investor side, yeah. wherein uh, you worked with uh, incubators, venture capitals. Uh, you worked, you not worked, but you've you've been on the advisory uh, and the investor investor side as well uh, on companies like Ajay, Kitalunos. Uh, Bukala Park, one of the earliest ones, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so let's let's talk a bit about that journey. Sure. Uh, so the idea is one part that let's let's hear from your let's see from your lens mm. how it was growing up back then, yeah. and second is how the whole ecosystem looked like, mm-hmm. right? Uh, some five ten years back, how the ecosystem was all over. Yeah. So um, I grew up here until elementary school and until there was a riot basically in 1998. And uh, I, I left to Seattle and grew up from Seattle and then Vancouver back then until I started working there for a couple of years, building my own small business as well and <laughs> selling that. But um, that time, there are two things that happened in my life, right? First is I had a major romantic breakup that was like, oh man, I don't want to be in this city too, right? Second, so there was a push factor. Second, there's a pull factor as well that Mm. a lot of uh, families and friends told me that, look, Indonesia is booming. You know, you need to come back. Which year was this, sorry? This was 2010, 2011. So I started going back and started to see, okay, you know what? I think Indonesia has potential and it's thriving. Mm. 
And so when I got back, um, I wasn't I wasn't really even in tech yet. I was uh, just doing my own small business. Okay. So it was uh, back in the day, photo booth was the in thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, but in Vancouver, we we created one where it's like an instant photo print, and there was no software and auto animation. You have to create everything on your own in your own garage, basically. Sure. When I came back here, same thing. We had to create everything, but the difference is it was a book. Uh, it was a flip book. Okay. So it was like video turned into a book. Okay. Used for like marketing activation, weddings, and so forth. So we're quite big. Very heavy on the cuteness element. Yeah, that yeah. that, and also interactiveness, sure. branding, and that. But then I realized that we're this is not like in the U.S. or North America where people enjoy making things. Yeah. Right after they, I have to prepare all the labor and and everything, everything. everything. So it yeah. became like very hard to scale. Mm. But luckily, we had we had somebody who wants to buy them. Did this? You started this over here. Yes, sir. In, 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 sir, in here in Flipbuku back then. Okay. Uh, back in 2000. And mm. One very important question. So uh, you've gotten over that breakup, yeah. or are you still? Oh no, real at times. No, <laughs> it was a, it was like a really uh, tough one. Really tough one, yeah. 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 But um, how old were you? That was man. That was man. Ten, eleven. What was that? Uh, I guess it's uh, what twenty five, twenty six. I think. Yeah, that's, that's a tricky one. That's, <laughs> that's a tricky age. I mean. You aren't immature enough. You're not mature enough. You're just out there in the middle. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you're just starting your. You're starting up your career. career uh, yeah. It it get it can screw up your head. Yeah. Uh, pretty strong. Oh, we are we are glad you got over well. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> look, uh, these things that I learned in life that whatever happened, I think uh, it's what whatever whatever happened before me. Makes, makes, uh, who you are right now. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Those learning experience it really helped as well yeah. uh, to mature up. I think I think for any individual, like especially male, the thing that will make them more mature is really having a girlfriend or having a lover. Man, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of the thing that that makes somebody a guy more mature, like faster. Just in my opinion, I I I agree. I agree. Or even like having a kid is like a totally different ball game after that. <laughs> I I I was I was I was who was I was talking to I was talking to Jimmy, yeah. uh, co-founder of Kita Lula. I didn't, I mean he's gonna be a, a father soon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he was asking me, I mean, how has your experience been? And I like look, I mean there is there's something which changes in you. Uh, it's it might be slightly physical as well. I feel yeah, but there is this sudden change which happens. Yeah. You feel it as a sudden change. It actually has happened over a period of time, but there's a sudden change which happens wherein you start seeing the world in a very different lens altogether. Mm. That's right. Right. Your your level of gratitude increases. Yeah. Uh, your level of uh, looking at final things in life, yeah. uh, the smaller moments that improves, or else before that you're all about scale. Right. Yeah. I mean. Only things done at large scale are going to find me happiness, right? Yeah. Only having that one crazy night of party in a large, maybe a dragonfly, yeah. is going to give me happiness. Yeah. Uh, right? It, it just it just changes. I agree completely. It is. It's what it's teaching me is being present, because being happy is really being being appreciative of what's being pr- uh, at the moment right now. Absolutely. Like in talking to you right now. It's if I truly, truly immerse of the present, I'll be truly happy. Absolutely. But um, is life just about happiness, right? Mm. So there's always that, that I'm always torn between the two. Like, okay, is it that or is it about creating that uh, impact and, and legacy? Which means that sometimes you have to detach yourself on, from, from this and think mm. about the future. Sure. Think about uh, beyond this uh, sense of happiness. And Do you think it's a very slippery road as soon as you uh, get into this theory of creating a legacy? Impact, I, I feel it's a very overrated and overused term, yeah. uh, to be honest. Uh, I mean, sorry if, if, I, if, worried, if I might come across as rude, but I personally feel it is, it's one of the most abused terms in recent years. You can call it like what? 
significant. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, especially the impact part, right? I mean, you hear a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of investors talking about impact. Uh, but I mean, it, it doesn't just... I think the impact could mean like, depending on the interpretation of each mm. one, right? What is impact to, to you and me, to other people, depends on their priorities in life. Absolutely. Yeah. For me, it shifts. It, it evolves over time. Back in the day, I was like, oh man, yeah, I'm going to create a big change in the whole economy, increase the GDP by a certain percentage, <laughs> news, right? So no, that's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but then like over time, you realize, damn, priorities change, man. Look, it, and after a while, you kind of start to see that I think my priority right now is to make sure that I have a good life with my with my family and that everybody is uh, well taken care of mm-hmm. and that you know uh, we we will be able to uh, create a lot of um, uh, what do I say like ensure that that my son my son's life uh, has meaning you know like going for um, after after providing him with a lot of the the basic needs that he has and also the equip him with all the skills and knowledge that he can thrive and create his own path. I mean, True. the name, my, my son's name, uh, Nalan, actually, it doesn't exist anywhere. We, we just sort of just created out of nowhere because my thinking is I want to have, I want to name him something where he actually can create his own path. Hmm. Right. Hmm. Hmm. He can, he can create a, a meaning to his own name. Yeah, because, exactly. So that's the sort of thing that I'm 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 thinking. I'm I'm, I'm prioritizing more and more my family, my kid, and, and so forth as I grow up, because hmm. I realize like, look, yeah, we can we can generate wealth, right? Like we can be rich. I mean, these days, if this is the only thing that we care about, then you know, um, the world. Do you think you being a bootstrap, uh, you being a bootstrap company? allows you to think this way and uh, prioritize your time uh, yeah. rather not prioritize I mean segment your time uh, accordingly so it it gives me time to slow down and think as well right because the thing is when we're always like back in the day when I was working at Rocket it was just like boom 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 like you have no time to think just execute all it let's let's go back to this time okay oh, i think we or else we'll get lost okay let's let's go back to uh let's go back to your first stint after you sold this company which was rocket internet so so i, I joined rocket internet uh, after that and start working for zalora it was with nadine kevin alui and uh, Catherine and a few others it was quite funny inside it was actually like six founders mm-hmm. um they all own like less than 1% of the entire venture, right? 99 point something percent is owned by Rocket. Mm. So it's it like an employee essentially. Mm. But everybody was like ex-management uh, management consulting. So this side is McKinsey, this side is Lazada. That's a standard Rocket uh, yeah. uh, uh, rocket theory. Yeah. And it was so funny because that time like they were just like, they were just like trading their own allies mm. and just fighting with each other. All the time, right? Until the point where the Laza, uh, the the BCG guys got kicked out and they start <laughs> Lazada, basically. Okay. And then the McKinsey guys, Kevin. Oh no, uh, it wasn't Kevin. It was, um, uh, I think it was Amit and Catherine and 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 uh, and and Nadine just stayed and then continued on, right? But that was um, there was a lot of drama in there, man. We grew to like two hundred people in like three months, and then. There was a lot of like, it was like a revolving door, like in and out. I've I've heard these <laughs> stories, not not with Zalora, but I've heard these stories from other rocket folks about uh, uh, different startups yeah. in India as well. So I, I I hear you. How long were you with uh, Rocket? It was uh, close to a year. Close to a year. Yeah. Very exciting yeah. year. Yeah, it was it was interesting. There was even like, man, the drama was like. There was one time where they, I think an HR or somebody left, and then I heard this where the whole salaries of the company was published on Costco's. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that was like really, really a tough time for, for the dollar. So I'm sure. Crazy amount of damage control. Yeah. 
And this is way back in 2012. Well, I mean, back then, 2012, you know, when, when we first started, it was literally like startup, right? Everything was on a spreadsheet. Yeah, 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 I don't yeah. think there was any protection or like systems and processes in place. Process in place. I'm pretty sure just like today when, when we heard the news about like Grab, there's fraud in Grab, there was fraud in like mm. Shopee, fraud in those companies have been around for a long time and still there's fraud, right? Damn. So you can imagine fraud there. There were back then, uh, uh, so, right? Uh, yeah. Interesting. So, so what, what happened after Rocket? So after Rocket, um, I I started this uh, together with Adi, Sarayman, and, and, and Amtech. We wanted to do LaCoupon, which is a group buying. Okay. Type, like Groupon, right? Okay. Um, but I decided that that, that wasn't going to make money. It was it was just like the model. Wow. How, how, was the, how was the funding environment back then? Back then, I think there was a lot more. It was just starting, basically. Okay. There, there were people, there were interests, but not a lot of investors were um, educated yet about the whole tech sector. Sure. So it was just it was just the beginning. Rocket was Rocket. As much as people who used to work there um, think that it was toxic, they had a lot of um, what do you call it? They were the one that the whole thing. I would say. Yeah, they, 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 they've done that, and uh, I think major developing countries yeah. like even back in India bringing food panda to India yeah. same model right rocket owns 98-99% yeah then you have like two or three founders uh, but with certain equity but they're because of their initiative the tech uh, sector in Indonesia and Philly thrive I'm sure it was uh, I, I could give them credit absolutely right? absolutely um, and I mean back to back to the story I we didn't end up doing a coupon so uh, Adi and I decided like, okay, what are we going to do in here? And and that back then she was saying like, look, I'm I'm going to create a new division in MTech for digital uh, and I need your help. So Ooh. I ended up helping him on that and, and building um many, many different ones like video and the others as well, helping uh, lay out the so th- this became sort of your proper conglomerate. Uh, I was working essentially... Uh, absolutely, yeah. How long did this last? This was 2013 to 2000, early 2015. Okay, you lasted two years. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, several years in there, but throughout the time, I kind of shifted different roles as well. Sure. Uh, one time I was doing business development, one time doing a lot of partnerships, and up to the point where I was doing deals for, for a family. Like, mm-hmm. um, I remember back then I was interviewing William and Tokopedia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and pitching uh, for investment. For investment. Okay. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I introduced to Adi and we sat down and he was pitching and we thought, mm, this is quite expensive. Yeah. And then like months later, we get invested by SolveBank. Oh, we whoa, 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 whoa. Boat, man. invested. <laughs> yeah. Invested big time. Yeah. So I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, like, oh, this was just before that 100 million check. Yeah, it's yeah, about. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Be- because we thought, like, Man, I think valuation is already quite expensive. It was too late. And then, so, okay, fine. We missed that boat. So what's next? Like, what, what are startups are there, right? And we and, and we, we spotted, like, hey, what's this on Alexa ranking? Mm-hmm. Buka Lapak, right? Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at this and dig deeper. Mm-hmm. And as I dig, dig, dig deeper, okay, it seems like this is uh, an e-commerce that is quite promising as well. So I just reached out to Fadrin on LinkedIn actually. Mm. Mm. There I still have it and Fajin was like Fajin Zaki kept saying like he even posted during the IPO like this is the legendary uh LinkedIn message <laughs> that spurred the whole thing. <laughs> and so that was uh that was really nice of him to to do that. Yeah. Um I mean acknowledging it way past yeah. Yeah, yeah I really I appreciate that part and and yeah uh, the rest is history. Like we just we just talked on LinkedIn and 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 we 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 get invited to their to their first office. It was really really uh like like a match like matchmate basically like sure sides really really needed each other. Mm. Yeah, so it was a good a really really good story as well. Yeah, sure. The first IPO in Indonesia. Yeah, 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 yeah. So actually, during that time when I was in MTech. Um, I was also involved in helping uh, what used to be Mountain Venture became Kajora, basically. Okay. So I was helping like Ashen and Andy Zayn as well back then. Um, and they, they had an idea like, hey, why don't we create the, verse, the first uh, tech conference that is quite 
massive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I have the Silicon Valley connection because my cousin um, is was the founder of Twitch.tv. Ah, and also uh, the other one is uh, the co-founder of uh, Cruise Automation, which is oh. like, yeah. sure. sure, and a lot of like YC guys. So he was, they were saying like, why don't you get them to come here and like let's do, let's let's bring them to Bali together, right? And like do yeah. offers. So this is what we did. We created NextCon, NXTCon. It was like 700 people that showed up back then, in 2014, with uh, two days, and we had. Eight founders from Silicon Valley, from like Y Combinator, multiple, sure. like Take Over Bernstein as well. Um, founder of Parse got sold to uh, Facebook as well. Yeah. And got the first female founder, uh, female engineer of Facebook, uh, uh, Ruchi Sangvi, and uh, Ray Chan from 9Gag as well. Yeah. So it was, it was a really, really fun uh, conference. Um, and what I learned from that, like listening and getting inspired by them, was that. I wanted to actually do make this impact. Back to the story of like why impact actually matters to me before it was really because of that. Like I get inspired. Like I, but, I mean, these, you know, these folks, folks yeah, yeah like, they, it can be very impressionable. Yeah, very further, impressionable, right? very convincing. I, I, I realized that Indonesia is so prime. There's so many problems that to be solved that the amount of impact that we can make is massive in Indonesia, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So. I was brainstorming with my co-founder back then, like, what is it that we need to do to solve, right? And we wanted to go leaps ahead beyond just like materialism, selling and buying commerce. And we went to do services, which was uh, blue collar services, essentially. So like, okay. AC, plumbing, you know, uh, cleaning, all those. So you start, you, you start a new so company. We started Sikmi back then. Sikmi. Sikmi is a service marketplace. Okay. Um, model after Thumbtack. In okay. The US. Thumbtack at that time when they first when we started mm-hmm. had a hundred million dollar investment from Google. Mm-hmm. So we thought okay, this system, this model that that could actually work out. Mm-hmm. Um, after raising Series A, we realized, man, the units of economics actually didn't make sense here. Mm-hmm. You no, know, because after we keep acquiring the customers, the retention was very very hard to stick. Because okay, what happened is when Things go well, they will just go direct to the vendor. Vendors, right. They would just bypass our system. What's up? But, up uh, yeah, but when, when things go like south, so they'll complain to you. They'll complain to us. So we're in a loser situation. There's not, there's nothing to win here. What what service areas were you catering to? Multiple, everything, almost everything. We just open it up to, to everything. So basically aggregated aggregate these service providers. We're so early yeah, that which areas are the ones that have the most? Sure. Uh, so, yeah. how, how big was your series about them? That was uh, almost 2 million. Yeah. It's a pretty good one for that time. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good one. Okay. Okay. And then what, what happened with uh, Sigma? So, well, I had a different different like vision basically with my show sure. under. I wanted to m- make it more sustainable, B2B. Hmm. I want to make sure that the units of economics actually makes more sense. But she wanted to still keep it where it's still original vision, like, where the, because the funding, the funding situation is still very very good at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could technically just, just show numbers, things. show numbers. Yeah. Yeah. just just volume, 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 right? Yeah. But I knew that like, look, in the long run, like, how long am I gonna be doing this? Like until exit, right? Hmm. If like just by doing some kind of like quick calculation, this could be like a more than ten years down the road kind of company until exit or even more, hmm. right? I mean, take a look at a lot of the e-commerce. They existed right. for, for 10 years, 10 more, and they have their IPO, right? Yeah. Whereas somewhere else in a more advanced country, is usually less than that, like five Good. years, four years sometimes. Mm-hmm. Right? So do I want to spend that, that amount of time doing this? Doing this when I know that the it's really, really going to be difficult to retain the, the clients. Mm-hmm. So what I was proposing to do is instead, for example, like supplier of, Daikin, like they they need installers. Mm. Why don't we just go and like go big with these enterprises, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So would have been more sustainable. Uh, yeah, as such. But but I think that time it was really hard to tell what decisions we should make, right? Because we don't know when there is like crunch, like right now. We we thought that oh, this could also keep continuing. The growth could could just 
Keep mm-hmm. uh, being inflated by investor money. That's that's a problem with good times. It feels like it's going to last forever. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. So, but but in my mind, I was already feeling like I I don't want to do this because at the end of the day, I know that I have to keep raising and raising is not my passion. Honestly, like I just want to do and build. It shouldn't be anyone's passion, to be honest. So, it is one of the most boring, boring, man. It's one of the most boring jobs. Yeah. It takes so much out of you. Yeah. And more importantly, it takes away that crucial energy, which as a founder, you need to grow your company. Yeah. Then to convince these uh, folks. Yeah. I mean, I'm extremely thankful to all the investors. They they help us yeah. in getting our dreams out there in the market. Uh extremely grateful but having said this i 100% agree with you it is actually the one of the most tiresome jobs ever no kidding <laughs> no kidding i have been in enterprise sales yeah. i have sold softwares worth million dollars yeah trust me this is much more tiring and difficult than that yeah it's there never were, there so uh, um i had i had some chinese friends who were saying to me like oh man you just gotta, you just gotta make it till you, you know, you just, you just fake it, fake it, it, it until you make it. Make it. Yeah. Apparently, that's the, the 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 norm in China, right? Hmm. I'm like, I don't know if I can do that, right? Like, this is something that, like, bullshitting and doing that. It just, it's just, just project strength, project strength. It's just something that I can do. It's, it's just not part of my ethical value, right? So. This is also why, like in 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 when we start Algorithm, we actually didn't need the capital. Like we 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 got we raised from our, uh, our investors. We ended up like returning those money, and we will we'll get into that discussion in detail. <laughs> Let's close this loop on sick yeah. uh, sick me. Sick me. Yeah. Okay. So how long did you run this? This was 2015 to 2016. Yeah. Okay. And then you exited the company. A little bit more in here, and then uh, I left the company, but I exited in 2008. Okay, so how, how does this work? I mean, let's spend like 5-10 minutes on this. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of founders, uh, which I know, I'm sure even you know, yeah. who are at that stage, wherein either they are not able to to be on the same wavelength with their co-founders, yeah. or not be on the same wavelength with their investors. Yeah. Generally, this happens in the bad time side. I mean, two char- true character comes out. Yeah, exactly. uh, and you finally figure out that, hey, listen, this I'm not cut for this, mm-hmm. or I'm not really keen on this, or whatever reasons, right? What goes through, uh, what goes through a founder's head at that point, mm-hmm. uh, and how do you deal with it? How how does this whole process work? The whole separation. Yeah. So I think at that time I was the first thing when I when I made this decision, it was really really difficult. First of all, we always have an attachment like it's our baby, right? Is that emotional? Very, very heavy. Also, sorry, were you the CEO? I was the CEO. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's talk also about the investor side. How do they take this yeah. uh, phone thing? Okay. So, well, I explained to them that there's irreconcilable uh, differences between me and my co-founder in terms of the vision and where we're going to take this. And I think it was also the mistake that we made early on was we had too many overlapping skill sets. Okay. Between you two. Between two. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the things that we made a mistake on was we didn't have a clear decision making structure where, okay, this is my area and this is your area, right? We sort of make decisions together all the time. While that's good to reach consensus, on a, on in practical it in, in 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 practice, it's actually quite difficult when you want to make a day to day decision, sure. Because then you always have to consult and then sometimes there's differing opinion and Honestly, there was a lot of different relationships or partnerships that was soured because I was unable to move. Mm. And those relationships were my personal relationships, right? You had equal equity? Um, I had a little bit more, yeah. Does does that, okay, uh, okay, we, I'll come to this yeah. question later. I have something in my mind. Okay, let's let's continue with this. Okay, so there was already, there were already differences. Yeah. Uh, uh, very similar skill sets. Yeah. So, Clarity of role is a problem yeah. uh, as well. Okay. Uh, so you first speak to your co-founder. You spoke to your co-founder about this, that you want to move out. Yeah. And uh, how did, it's a she, right? How did yeah. she take it? Yeah. I mean, 
we were both very emotional, to be honest. That, you know, mind you, I was still young. She was still young. I'm sure we were we were hot headed as well. So, and then we're like, okay, look, we need a we need somebody in the middle. And that time, I think Steven Banada from Cyber Agent Venture, <laughs> he was he was one of the best, I think, investor that I know that really mediated for us and was very very uh, rational and 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 helped us throughout the process. I think that I could give an, a credit of how an investor or VC could help moving forward to end the demo. How how, how did he how did he uh, do that? I mean, just uh, just give us some just give us something more. Yeah. Uh, so so for example, like on the different different strategy and vision, um, for for him, he obviously from the VC side, I can also see that. They want to be able to increase the valuation and grow. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, that's the whole premise of being in a VC, right? Hmm. So, or already automatically, my my vision doesn't really fit with that. So, I totally understand that. And he was explaining to me, like, look, if if this is not something that you envision, you could continue on and and have the same kind of vision as as the others, including the investors. This might not be for you, which. I, I agree, and that's why I decided to relinquish my control as well, right? Sure. Which I think a lot of, I've heard several founders out there, they have a different way of doing things and sure. how they actually got out. But for me, I think, look, I want to make sure that that seek me actually continue and succeed. So whatever it is that ensure that this is, uh, this, this company is sustains, I'd, I'd help and make sure that that, that continues on. So it was quite fair because Steven was proposing, why don't you just uh, become a chairman and then this kicks. So you mm. still hold some of the shares, but you're not on a day-to-day. So that's you're not basically part of the operations. Yeah. Okay. But uh, because a lot of the investors in SeekMe was still my in my relationship, yeah. I raised through my personal yeah, I, I want to. I want to. I want to. I yeah. want to hear more on this. I still feel some sort of responsibility. There yeah, and and I wanted to. I, I continually still like uh, check in and and go for. But the hard part is, I think, in the last few few moments of uh, the 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 startups um, until Sigmi was exited was the communication with the internal team. It was almost impossible. Yeah, sure, I'm sure. Okay, so I mean, look, uh, especially your annual rounds, your initial mm-hmm. rounds, you are raising money from a lot of your known friends, uh, in some cases, family and uh, and lot more. Once you've done that and something like this happens, mm. right, wherein it's you who's taking the call yeah. of uh, moving out, yeah. uh, do you feel that uh, it, it becomes of utmost responsibility for you to go and talk to each of them individually and explain yeah, them one this. So I actually called them one by one. I explained to them of what happened and that I ensure that like look, Clarissa is still gonna be taking care of this company moving forward. She still has a lot of strong vi- uh, strong belief and and, yeah. and vision on this, right? So I told them um I think uh, I'll continue and like watch over this in company, essentially, right? Um, that's that's what I explained. But in practice, over time, I think it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because it becomes difficult for me to yeah. even have access to the company. Correct, correct. At one point, I was just banned. Like there was no, I don't. I was kicked out of the investor circle. Hmm. I don't have community. I basically got blocked on WhatsApp, so I couldn't even contact. I couldn't even hmm. talk to anyone. So oh. and then like. Okay, I can't really do much in this case. We're like, what? What else can I do? What What happened with the Sekmi? It still exists. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's all sold out to uh, Thai. Uh, Good exit. It was okay. Decent. So okay exit. I mean, if it was an okay exit, it's still okay. It's yeah, still good. Right. I mean, okay. Yeah. So okay. So you've had this share of experience. Yeah. Uh. I, I we will come to what you do at Algorithma, mm. but uh, I want to focus conversation more about um, you. You learned a few things from this experience. How do you deploy this experience when you're starting Algorithma? Be it from finding a, a co-founder, uh, 
raising money yeah. or whatever money you raised yeah. uh and what were your thoughts like i mean you were you still thinking about building a, a company at massive scale growth at any cost or had it changed that okay let's start small create a sustainable business what uh, what changed in you with this experience so i think back when i was in sikpe uh, because we had money we we spent and sometimes we when we spend we didn't learn much from it because we just kept on moving for okay this one doesn't work let's go move forward but we didn't really slow down to really analyze like what is actually did we learn what were the insights from this mm-hmm. and when we when we look into the data there is always very lopsided like it's 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 very hard to read as well right data as well also we didn't have the proper people at that time to analyze the data so i think no one had it back then i believe there very very few folks very few folks very few folks and we try to learn ourselves right um you know the whole thing about cltv and all the different metrics in fact there were some times where i realized that i learned from there was we set the wrong metrics on certain things like all these activities that we do we forget to connect it to revenue the revenue or the bottom line pretty much right hmm. like we're doing all this like what looks good on paper the pr the marketing everything right about the line but how did you connect these all these activities that we do that kept us busy to the revenue it wasn't connected there wasn't <laughs> there wasn't a uh funnel that was set up that was proper right and of course there are some things that you cannot you cannot measure like putting things on billboard or, or really? like branding you can't measure it's really really difficult to do that done but some of the ads and so forth it wasn't properly measured right so and sometimes we because of that we actually hired agency sometimes yeah. and then we had a startup free like, startup hiring agency is always a bad idea it was a bad idea we learned a lot from that like yeah. three different agencies saying three different things, things. Yeah. and what we realized was these agencies don't even know what they're doing as well no but they, i mean they have look they don't know what you are doing yeah and then they will tell you something which will come across as something which is way far away yeah. from your core positioning core voice yeah. but it looks fancy though it you got to give that yeah. you got to give that yeah. i mean it's very similar to startups hiring a pwc or a mckinsey for uh, for advice really yeah uh, i mean you can see there was like opposition went up and everything impression went up engagement went up but then uh when we talk about retention it's just it's just not there right when we talk about uh revenue it's just not there Hmm. So what does that say? I mean like did they did they run a campaign where the targeting was just they didn't target correctly and they just basically like put on money to incentivize people to download it or was it just purely fraudulent which actually happened? Yeah, like a lot like a whole farming thing that's yeah. going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean yeah, people have actually made very large amount of money yeah. uh doing this. The winner are Google and Facebook and <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Uh, the big daddies 70% of like the spending on our marketing was just on google and 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 facebook man and it's a, it's a circle of venture money yeah <laughs> <laughs> the vc just all goes back to that they're the winner in the end. Yeah, yeah absolutely okay so you take all these learning yeah uh, how do you go about deciding that uh i'm not going to repeat my mistakes mm-hmm. uh, in terms of finding synergies with my next co-founder and did you want a co-founder in the first place or how did this happen uh for algorithm for algorithm i met sam back in the day when i was in mtech and he was working there as well and i thought he was a really really brilliant dude like one of the best out there right so uh when i met him again we were just like having drinks at uh, sky mm-hmm. in uh, in <laughs> bishad aur and we were talking about this i i was like man you know ai and data i think this is the area of opportunity after investing in plug and play there's all this problem she has been doing this for a while in analytics basically mm-hmm. and and he also realized i think 
this is time for him to actually move on and and, and build something. Mm. So um, we both had passion in, in, in training, and and we decided that look, I think this is uh, this this whole data piece. We can actually work on this, but what I what I want to make sure is you handle the technical side. Well, I handle the business side, and I don't want to make the same mistake again as before, where we have a lot of overlapping uh, roles and good. Right. And until today, it's still like this. Sometimes my boys ask me, like, it seems like we have two small com two two companies inside. <laughs> yes, it's true. It feels that way, but at the same time. Um, we ensure that the style and differences don't and don't don't end up in conflict, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you started this in 2017. Mm -hmm. Why Why not start it as a a services company straight away? Start mm -hmm. serving, let's say, uh, no. startups or conglomerates or whatever, but rather go in uh, education, right? My My belief. At the day, it all the talent are the ones that matter. If okay. we're able to build good talents out of this system, then at the end, when we want to do services or build product, we can leverage on those talent that we already built, right? Okay. So my my thinking is that it's been six years running. Right now, we're actually developing something of our own a product as well. So that's in line with the timeline that we have set. Maybe give and take, we are late by one year. It's supposed to be at the end of five years, but because of COVID, sure. But uh, we finally have something that we're building right now. It's a SaaS platform? Yeah. Um, it's still under stealth, but sure. this is something that we're building. Sweet. Um, again, it's back to the, to the talent. Back then in 2017, there was nobody. We yeah. had to build our own. Even R, nobody's using R. Yeah. We had to bring in R. We actually had to build in to ensure that the library install in R. In Indonesia, actually, mm -hmm. just, just just to give an idea, please. Yeah. I know what is R. Yeah. Please explain what is R. R is one of the programming language in data science that is widely used, aside from Python. Python. So yeah. Python is a general purpose language, but R is more specific uh, for for data science. Um, both both works, mm -hmm. but um, it just depends on preference, really. Sure. Right. And um, nobody was doing R. Essentially, mm -hmm. like everybody else who are existing, only know Python. Yeah. and how to do how to use uh create data science to think python mm. so after that a lot of the other competitors start using that as well right mm. but uh, so you started this in 2017 sorry in 2017 uh you started with your own money you raised anything yeah. i'll start with our own money first and then mm. uh we raised later on with, uh, and we raised from the Satria, we raised from uh in to from this individual called Craig Crichton. She was the um, generally insurance uh, commissioner. Um, we raised for a politician in Singapore. <laughs> eh? um, and uh, we also raised uh, from... Uh, so it was a pure angel round of... Yeah, angel round. Angel round. After that round, we never really raised again. So that's the only round you are on? And you've already given them an exit? And also offer from the corporate family. Sure. So you giving them an exit already or no? Uh, almost, almost all, only, only a few left. Yeah. Okay. Did Did you have this planned out that we don't really want to be in that uh, zone that we keep raising? Honestly, originally, when we when we raised it, it was really because of PKP, because we are Singapore based that we actually brought in. Okay. So we're required to have a minimum capital, right? Okay. And uh, yeah, I think yeah. it was two billion milliard, right? Yeah. Two and a half million at that time. Yeah. Now it's ten. Yeah. 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 So over time, we actually return those money, right? Because mm -hmm. we 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 got profit and from the cash flow, we return eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, the re the the reason why we return are two things, right? First, Sam and I realized I think there's uh, a lot of potential in this company. We sure. Um, we believe more of, of this company that we want to actually increase our our control more and more. Surely, mm -hmm. right? Uh, second is because I felt that at this moment, this is not the type of startups that need a lot of money. True. So what's, it would be highly irresponsible to keep the investor money. Correct. When it's not actually being used and utilized at all. Mm -hmm. So we'd rather return it with interest. That's what we did. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, you started off in this education space, basically teaching uh, students about data science. Uh, if I just try to think, this was way back in 2017-18, there wasn't much of competition. Revo, you existed back then? No. It there started was, in 2019. 2019. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of companies started 2020 during COVID. During COVID. And they were, I, if I'm not wrong, they were majorly focused towards digital marketing and yeah. a bit of product and more. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then they started going through data analysis when they see that there is a lot of, yeah. of course, of course. Why do you think, uh, again, I'm sure you, mm. you can't speak on their behalf, but yeah. just your opinion. Why do you think they have gone in a direction where they have raised large amount of money, be it Hacktivate or uh, or uh, Revo U? Uh, uh, to be honest, yeah. I'm uh, I'm a fan of uh, the work as yeah. they do. Yeah. I've hired people uh, from both Revo U and Hacktivate, yeah. and uh, I've had a pretty pretty good experience. Yeah. Uh, so so I would like to say that I I like the work which they do, right? right? Uh, but why do you think that there is this difference? Wherein the okay. it's in a mo is it in a model or a thought process? I what I think back then, like Hacktivate was around the same time as, as us, yeah. um, but maybe Ronald was a bit earlier. Um, and when Ro Ronald and I were just walking and talking, and he he was already like, "Oh, you actually raised like he he didn't raise. I mean, he was from pretty much also bootstrap. Hmm. And he, you can race for this school. All right, I'll put it in and when he raised, he raised me. He is big. He big. Yeah, he raised big. Yeah. So good for him, like yeah. really. But for me, what I realized is that money doesn't solve everything. Like, the, where's the main pain point of the school? It's really the talent, the instructor. Right? But that's that's what that's what my question was, right? I mean, in this module, with limited understanding yeah. which I have with this module, let's say today, uh. Let's say today I, I really like you and I give you $10 million. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with that? Man, that would be more like what product am I going to be building next? That's, not, Th that's, that's not different related. altogether. That's not related, right? Yeah, it's not you, related. Your model I is to build something more scalable. Yeah. Basically. yeah. Which I don't think uh, uh, it requires large amounts of investments. I mean, because your, your acquisition costs are fairly lower. Uh, I think your major cost uh, would be instructors, yeah. uh, the quality of instructors, of yeah. course, uh, instructors, learnings, and more. I mean, the formula has always been learning offline is the best quality that you can get. Right. So, in meaning that if you, because we, we tried even during the pandemic, like doing online learning and everything, quality as best as we can, we, we tried our best to get it out. But I don't think they're employ they're an employable quality. They're more like, they're upskilling and they're they're ready to hmm. just um, create something of their own. But if we have to say they're employable in the industry, I think it's quite difficult sure. um, to to guarantee that. So offline is really where the quality is. And hmm. for me, a school is all about reputation and trust, hmm. right? So if the quality is there and reputation is uh, is is there. That's where we have a source of growth. That's where we have repeats. That's where we have a lot more people trusting our institution and, and coming back and, and going through the school, right? So for me, it's it's more growth through that through quality, through the depths of the of the knowledge and experience sense. Yeah. And true. And everybody's just talking about like very fast growth. But for us, there is something uh for us in the, there, there also room for linear growth startup like that. Sure, sure, sure. So you, you've been profitable uh, since, yes. since, day since day one. Yeah. If we really pay attention to that units of economics. Okay. Yeah. You, you learned it hard. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, you, you, uh, you don't need to, but uh, just, just for motivation, uh, to a lot of aspiring on entrepreneurs out here, uh, do you, do you mind sharing what kind of ARR you would be at? Most kind of what? AR, annual recurring uh, revenue of sorts. J this is just for motivation. I, I, can, I can give a range between two to three. It's amazing. Yeah. This is really amazing. Yeah. Uh, congratulations. Thanks. Great, great, great work done. Okay. Uh, what 
you know a lot of founders, right? I think there are quite a few founders which we know in common as well. A uh, lot of them are going through a, a very bad phase. Uh, quite a few have rebounded, right? I mean, like like Rishab from Disserv, he's in high spirits again you now that he's building. Uh, he's gone through a, a pretty low phase. Then there are quite a few others who are foreseeing that, yeah. right? When you meet them, what what do you what do you talk? What do you tell them? I think I would empathize. I would understand where they're coming from. I mean, running this for six years, I can feel the burn as well, right? Like, and going through that those kind of uh, downtime, I've I've gone through it as well during COVID. Algorithm, we almost ceased to exist, man. I'm sure we had to do a lot of cuts. We had to do a lot of like drastic changes. In fact, like I still remember my presentation to the team was like, look, we're all on the same boat going through the storm. So we need to brave for impact and everybody has to make sacrifices and, and just be on, on manning their port, right? Yeah. So that I still remember very, very clearly and very fresh from the experience. And going through those those kind of things again, it's just, it can be mentally hiring. But how do you, like, for example, I, I think empathizing is number one thing that I would, I would, uh, how would you, uh, I mean, this, this is a question which I've asked quite a few entrepreneurs. So let's take an example that, let's say you are a startup, which you started in COVID, let's say, uh, happy, happy days, uh, almost free money. Uh, you raised a pre-seed of 2 million, you ended up raising a seed of 5 million, which used to be a norm, mm -hmm. 5, 6 million uh, dollars of seed round. Yeah. And the mandate was that you keep growing, keep spending, keep growing, we'll figure out the revenue later. Keep growing, don't worry, we are here to give you a A, or a, uh, or if you're at A, a series B, we are here to give you. Uh, but now it's like, no, you cannot. Uh, we cannot give you more money. Yeah. Uh, figure out your unit economics now. So there's a massive DNA shift which needs to be done within the organization. Sometimes it's really hard, man. As a human being to just make that kind of shift. We're not like a machine where... Not programmed that way, right? Programmed like life, like things like... Things like uh, the way we think. It's, 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 it's essentially a neural pathway, right? Hmm. The neural pathway are created over time, over multiple actions, right? And experiences. So, I, if I'm in that situation, I might not even have the knowledge or experience to realize what I, what what situation I'm in, and what I even need to do. Sometimes we are just so much in the zone that we can't even think outside of the box, and we we don't we don't know what 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 are the next path or or, or what we need to do. We're still blindsided, basically, right? So I think. It's it's tough to say um, you shouldn't be doing this or you shouldn't be doing that uh, in that situation because we're not in their field. We're not a absolute both. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. True, 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 true. Do you do you think media made uh, entrepreneurs way larger heroes than uh, than they should have? I remember back then, right? Like, if you want to be famous in Indonesia, it's very easy back then during the start of phase. You can just go to media, they'll be like, oh, hey, yeah, like, we'll, we'll interview you. There's so many, many companies or founders who are like that, uh, that I know that they, they, they said like, look, my type is limited. Mm -hmm. I might as well make myself famous because my field kept, could start, could fail, but I could continue on if fun fates, right? Mm. I will survive in the end. Do you think this, 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 the, the fame, the fame is kind of addictive? The what? The famous kind of addictive people get addicted. To I think they're. I think. I think people do get that kind of addiction, and they end up like you know. But you know, Indonesians, even some corporates, they ended up like appointing people into some prominent positions because of the PR, hmm. right? So it worked. It happened. So it worked. It, it worked for some people. You know, like some some people became commissioners at some major organization because of their PR self PR push. Even though their business is not doing well. Hmm. And even in politics as well, right? True, true. So that's just the nature of like 
being in Indonesia, like reputation matters so much here. Mm-hmm. And if you can build a very strong reputation through PR whatsoever, sometimes that, what do you call that, that, that cloud could get you somewhere. Sure. Less so in like countries that with, with a lot of people with a lot of very strong critical thinking, right? Mm-hmm. In this case. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. What, what do you, what according to you is the outlook from uh, an overall startup ecosystem uh, for the next couple of years? What, what, what is your thought? Uh, it's definitely not going to be easy funding wise as well as, um, um, you know, um, figuring out which deep tech they want to be in because right now it seems like the VCs are trying to go into businesses that are more profitable. Mm. Well, obviously if you're for profit, it's it's not necessarily there for growth, right? Correct. So, like, and then if you want to do tech, you really want to make sure that this is highly scalable and you grow really fast. Mm. That's the nature of being in tech. Correct. Today, right? Correct. So my company is not, it's not tech for sure. My my company is non-tech. It's pure play services company. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Your services happen to be technology. Yeah. But yeah, you're a services company. We're just powered by tech. Of course. Right. Mm. So this is the kind of businesses that, that VCs are into these days. Who is that? So, yeah, like like traditional company that is powered by tech, right? So it's 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 been like in the last six months, mm. the trend has been going to but, but but again, I mean the same question is why why would you need uh why would you need VC money? Because the VC have collected so much LT money <laughs> they're like, What the hell am I gonna do if I don't deploy this? Yeah. And how, how, how am I being responsible, right? But at the same time, like when they deploy it, they, they don't want to deploy it to, when they know that uh, the climate has changed, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and like they're investing in a highly risky business that, that, that's going to fail. So what are they going to do? Sure. And they don't have much of a choice too. Sure. Sure. I, think, I think for tech, right? Indonesia or Southeast Asia is, is, it has the potential However, it's it's very challenging because um, what we see is the GDP per capita over time since I came back until today has not really risen. What 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 was right. the GDP per capita when you were? Thirty-seven dollars, forty-seven. Okay, give and take with exchange rate and everything. But the inflation also you got to consider, right? Yeah, that too, of course, right? And but at the same time, I was expecting double, at least double, right? Mm. When we talk about GDP, like mm. if we're following the China model and, and so forth, mm. I don't feel like Indonesia is growing fast enough. Do you think wealth redistribution is a problem? Wealth distribution is definitely one of the problem, and in in that sense, I think the government tried. They have good intention. They have noble intention to distribute this. However, two problems here, right? Indonesia is largely funded by corporate tax revenue. Mm. Tax collection of the public is very low, very low. It's below thirty percent. I think thirty percent still. I yeah. look at India; it's below ten percent. I think it's very, very low, right? And so, who is the government going to listen to? The corporates, mm-hmm. right? This is why I think, like, when we talk about a lot of the government initiative, then they would support the conglomerates, the big companies, to put funding and in there as well, right? Sure. Um, and so, why are we? not yet at the knowledge based economy or even services we're still in manufacturing and pretty much na- uh, natural resources right yeah is because that's where the taxes revenue are coming from mostly from those natural resource extractions mm-hmm. and those companies are the one that are paying the, the 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 government as well as the financial sector the banks and so forth it may have a lot of uh, money uh, tax paying to the government right mm-hmm. so Ultimately, I think if Indonesia really want to succeed, right, um, either they really fully support, like take the Korean model of the the conglomerates there, uh, what do they call it, chables, mm-hmm. and supercharge and like put steroid in them, mm-hmm. become like Samsung and so forth, so that they can actually flourish outside of Indonesia. Sure. Or you really do it properly to help the uh, small medium enterprises with the right infrastructure and the right uh, funding and everything. Mm. Unfortunately, this part is much harder when you're going into all these different small players, right? Correct. 
Because what happened is there's a lot of corruption that's happening. Yeah. The money doesn't actually trickle down to them. True. That's been the biggest problem with capitalism, but I think that's another podcast for some other day. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's do a quick, quick segment. I'm going to name a few uh, ve- verticals or sectors, and uh, you can just share your thoughts in a line or two. Yeah. Right. Uh, so let's start with uh, edutech. Hmm. So I think in education technology, there is a lot of uh, pullbacks from the investors. Uh, they're seeing that. A lot of the growth since 2020 has been largely funded by government, hmm. right? Government subsidies like Kartu Prakarja. So we never took it. Zero, zero money from Kartu Prakarja. Hmm. Because my co-founder and I were thinking like, this is going to distort our revenue. Hmm. I know money is there, but it's, the distortion is going to be big. And by the time if we're going to be dependent on it, it's like a drug, basically. And that's really what happened to a lot of the educated startups. Startup. They became so dependent on like subsidies that they don't even know where to make real money. Well, that's the beauty of being, right. uh, that's the beauty of being bootstrapped. Yeah. You could take those calls. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fintech? Fintech, I think it's uh, quite interesting where there's still a lot of unbanked. There's still a lot of uh, things to be solved. Um, I think right now, with crypto busts and so forth, mm. um, the government, probably the OJK, uh, could, how do I say it? They, they need to ensure that the trust by the consumers are still there. Otherwise, this uh, this this whole growth will be jeopard- jeopardized, right? This whole industry will be jeopardized because there's a lot of like really bad players out there as well or they're um, even not licensed as well. So I think, uh, were you invested in cryptos? I was in uh, Zitmax before, okay. and that was, I lost a lot of, a lot, shitload of money there <laughs> when they closed down. I'm sure. Yeah, so Zitmax is uh, originally from Thailand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to Indonesia. Yeah. Um, what I learned from that was that yeah, when it, I, I, I helped and put money in there because of friendship, right? Because I know the founders and so forth. Yeah. And because I was uh, ensured that, hey, when you're close to the founders, you'll be fine. Right? Mm. But I think when money money uh, is in play, it's a different story. Yeah. It gets very tricky. It, it gets, gets very, tricky. very, very tricky. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think, I think crypto is probably one area where um, it, it's it's going to go through a lot of tough times and winter ahead. Mm. Um, a lot of people are just burnt by it. the trust level is quite low. Um, I think companies like uh, like stock trading, like like Ajayip and the others, um, it's still faring better. But of course, during this, they're still operating in a very regulated yeah, market. Very, very um, but I think the challenge with uh, stocks are, well, how do you make money during this kind of doubt little bit and slow growth and so forth? So until the U.S. interest rate really drops, I think we're not going to see hmm. a lot of. How about influencer marketing? That one, most recently with the government trying to stab, uh, stab the TikTok yep. commerce and so forth, I think that's going to be quite massive uh, change there that's happening in social growth, right? Um, I understand as well that uh, the local e-commerce players um, and uh, the small medium enterprise, I think less so the small medium enterprise, I think a lot of this, I, agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think all these e-commerce players yeah. are, are, are like uh, lobbying the yeah. government yeah. and has a lot of power and money to lobby the government to mm. just ban TikTok basically outright from encroaching to their territory. I mean, TikTok can always start another platform doing live selling. Mm-hmm. Basically, the whole point is that don't do live selling on social yeah. media. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm. Okay. Uh, which tech is left out there? Well, I mean, agri-tech is... Agri-tech, yeah. yeah. I can see yes. It has a massive agriculture potential and I've seen some founders who are trying to aggregate uh, small small plant, uh, farms farmers into big plantation. Correct. 
for efficiency. Correct. I think that's that's a really good move there. Um, solving from the supply side, especially. Um, but uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So just just a very quick question, Nagari Tech. Uh, I, I feel it's a large problem. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely agree. But from what I have also seen is that there are large there are there are companies which are which are into agri tech, mm-hmm. but where founders have absolutely zero idea yeah. about what the farmers uh, struggle yeah. through yeah. or what they are doing. Yeah. Uh, in fact, one of them, uh, the founders never even visited uh, yeah. a farmer. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I think it it is more of riding on the wave of mm. the segment sector being sector. hot, yeah, that's right. yeah. uh, rather than really working out the problem. I mean, what do you think about e fishery? Like, is does it warrant the one billion dollar valuation? I am absolutely no one to talk about the valuation. <laughs> no. But having said this, I feel I like the founder. Yo, yeah. I I I, I yeah. uh, absolutely love the founder. Haven't met him. Yeah. But from whatever I've heard about him from other founders. Yeah, he was in my uh, Google Watch Pad. Ah, nice. Really I mean, I, I like that he comes from really humble background yeah. and uh, good founder. I, I like the way he is not really uh, out there to make mm. noise. Yeah. Uh, valuations, I mean, I think that's a different podcast altogether, man. I mean, we can go about valuations yeah. in the last whatever two or three years but maybe maybe, maybe. But i think the business model is sharp yeah i think i think the business model is sharp though yeah i think there is a massive problem that he's solving it's it's absolutely it's a matter of like how do you how do you get this adopted fast enough right to correct. Everywhere. Correct. Yeah. correct 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 indonesia is the right place for fishery anyway because it's sure where we're actually like the sea, right? We're archipelago. So. True, true, true. Makes and I, I think I think they are doing it in a very on-ground manner. Yeah. Uh, so that is something which I like. Valuations, I have absolutely no idea. Yeah. Uh, I, I still don't understand, to be honest, how uh, venture capitals uh, value startups. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's way beyond my uh, comprehension right now. I mean... I don't know what the numbers are, but I would. It's I, I've I've heard or I've seen some startups uh, who are just starting, and their valuations already like quite insane, right? So, I think it's also because they believe in the founder so much. They probably invest a lot into the founder. So look, I mean, very early stage, yeah. I can understand. Very early stage because there's nothing to show, right? I mean, let's say for example, when you were starting, there's not much to show. I'm mean, like, okay, uh, I, I I like this guy. Well, also depends, like. Even SpaceX, hmm. Tesla is riding a lot on also Elon's, Elon's personality. personality, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's founder driven. It's also so I, I, there's also that on. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. But then again, if you're talking about a Series A or a Series B, a uh, billion dollar, ten billion dollar valuations, I think that ideally should be revenue driven. Ideal in the ideal world, yeah, it should be revenue driven. Like I, have, I'm, I know of SaaS companies. Mm-hmm wherein their valuations are 60x of their ARR, okay? Now, the problem is because you have raised your last round at 60x of your ARR, for you to reach or raise the next round, you go to (laughs) achieve 60x ARR, which everyone knows is once in a, once chance of one one in a minute. Man, I mean, this is also, yeah, this was, I can't believe it still exists today, but this was, uh, I thought this was like the trend back in the day before. No, I'm talking about 2022. 2022, okay. And I mean, look, the same SaaS company, yeah. I'm not going to name, the same SaaS company has now taken debt. I'm like, SaaS company does not need debt. <laughs> uh, if I will get it tattooed, <laughs> yeah. SaaS companies don't need debt. I mean, what kind of SaaS company are you if you're taking debt? Yeah, we are they are they paying very fat salaries to some executives? Oh, I'm not it's, it's very weird. But either ways, yeah. yeah so uh, yeah, let's talk about SaaS. What are your thoughts? Hmm. In this region, and I think it's it's not as easy. I mean, look at Makari. They've been existing. I think they're one of I would say one of the top straw players here. Hmm. 
but there are all other ones that are trying to rise as well. But Makari has also been supercharged by Mid Plaza Kurehanda as well, right? Correct. Um, I think the the ways to one day execute it also has been excellent. Not a lot of founders are are like that. Um, but it's tough, man. I think they're 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 hustling every single day. They've been hustling for so long too, right? Yeah. And, I'm, and trust me, they'll continue to. Yeah, I think they will continue to still have to hustle a lot as well. So that's that's when my next question yeah. comes in. Do you think SaaS is overdone? I think SaaS, if only targeting Indonesia or Southeast Asia, is not going to be attractive enough. I think it has to, if we do SaaS, it better be global. So I, I speak to a lot of CFOs, yeah. right? Uh, I've been speaking to a lot of them, uh, thanks to my uh, enterprise sales background. But now, even now, I speak to a lot of them. And they, right now, in this environment, they have a single point agenda. They are like, why the hell we have 20 different subscriptions? So they are right now on a consolidation. Yeah. Because I mean, look, earlier, everyone's pitch used to be, why are you paying sales for so much? Yeah. I can do the work in this amount. I tag another one, yeah. tag another one. You're paying 50% of what you pay to sales, Salesforce, for example. But gradually, <laughs> the amount of subscriptions which companies have yeah. was massive. And, and, and managing this. Is is quite a challenge. Okay, right. Every, everyone sees it's software as a service, but you there have to agree company. that you need to have people to run that service, yeah, yeah. run that software. Yeah. There is a company that does that from Japan that actually aggregates the whole thing. Is that? Yeah. So I know of one company in India, I'm forgetting its name, which basically does SaaS optimization. Mm -hmm. So talks to you about how much money you're wasting on your subscriptions and uh, how well can you optimize it. Yeah. In Indonesia, especially in my experience, because I've been yeah. uh, uh, in SaaS yeah. on sales side and on consulting side yeah. and now the buyer. Yeah. So I'll... Depends. I think it depends on the subscription price, no? Yes. Because if, if you, if, if the price uh, is actually more expensive than hiring somebody or an intern, to manageable, yeah. No, no, the bigger there's a bigger problem. Like for example, let's say marketing technology. Yeah. Right. So let's say you onboard one of the platforms for your push notifications, email campaign, WhatsApp, SMS, blah blah blah. Chenny, the problem is that you let's say buy that platform, but you don't really have expertise to run it. Yeah. Now all these SaaS platforms are not willing to give you a hands-on support throughout. They can't afford to, their unit economics won't work. Let's just take it from a very simple example of ChatGPT. It's freaking straightforward, okay? Hmm. Many people still don't know how to properly use it. The prompts. The prompts, they don't even know like, what's temperature? Hmm. Like seriously, like, uh, or even, they don't even know that ChatGPT requires context. So they just ask them question and expect answer. Hmm. So I think, these even these uh the knowledge of how to use tools is not there or something true right? true 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 so training is one of the thing that maybe SaaS companies would need to do and it's quite expensive too absolutely absolutely so yeah i mean with SaaS, especially in indonesia i think uh, i think that's a massive struggle yeah. uh what do you think about the uh, the TAM as such of Indonesia. Ah, uh, that one I, I wanted to go. Yeah, because I I, th I feel uh, it is very uh, overestimated. I think it's very overestimated. And there was this notion that there are two things, right? If we talk about TAM for SaaS, mm. um, I think it's overestimated the amount of money that the enterprises are going to spend. Correct. And if their adoption is going to be faster. Faster, okay. correct. Um, what people don't realize is even for government, it's largely relationship based. Absolutely. Right. Even even local corporates, the old school ones, is mm -hmm. largely relationship. True. And relationship does scale. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, very, yeah. very hard. Right. Correct, correct, correct. Like correct. um, how do you get the top down to push all this initiative? Mm -hmm. You have to build relationships. It's not like in the US or whatever where it's like self service and everything. And it's quite different here. How about B2C? 
I think the for, time for B two C for time B two C that's that's the other part where I have concern on. Back to the back to my concern about GDP per capita, right? When the GDP per capita is not like what I envisioned to be double as before, then what happened is the per per basket size is not going to grow as much as we hope for. I agree. That means, and acquisition cost becomes more and more expensive as more and more competition comes in. Correct. During before COVID. Marketing spend per per acquisition is so cheap, man. Much much cheaper than after COVID. Correct. Because everybody suddenly became aware about digital and the power of digital. Hmm. They start spending money in digital, right? And there's so there was so much is money. Is there was so much of money in the market. Yeah, that too, right? Okay. So when 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 that becomes really really expensive to acquire a customer, your expectation is the CLTV becomes really is much higher mm. and also basket size average best size also is higher but it's not rising as fast as we hope mm. so i think e for example e-commerce it's a marathon game who has the long mm. breath right correct why do we see bleebly just they don't care we just keep keep it as this jaru jaru man they're like the soft bank of indonesia they don't need soft bank right. but you know like yeah. whatever man we'll just keep bankrolling this until everybody dies Right, I think they're going to be the one that lasts, right? and hmm. um, and I don't know. Maybe if TikTok has a lot of like, if TikTok survive, it's because TikTok has a lot of money from China. As well. Correct. So um, like, I mean, TikTok as, as an entity itself is heavily profitable. Yeah, and in the making yeah. crazy shitloads of money. Exactly. So I can see why like Goto and like Tokopedia are like, oh shit, like what's gonna happen? Our stock price is tanking. Is not working out. Why do you think their stock prices are tanking? Ah, uh, I mean, financially, it's not profitable. But why did it go up in the first place then? Like anybody else, like Bukalatok, right? Mm. Want to exit? <laughs> mm. Somebody wants to exit, so you gotta do that. And somebody wants to make money from it, from from uh, secondaries mm. as well. Yeah. Interesting. I, I, it, I think it was a very, very refreshing chart. Uh, especially, there, no, there's no successful exit in Indonesia yet, man. Uh, unfortunately, I have to agree to you. Yeah. I have to. It's unfortunate to be honest. Yeah. I think, I think. Uh, when I mean successful exit, it doesn't mean that like people, the founders, they make money as such. Well. I'm talking about this, the uh, the stock price. Is correct, correct. Which is just, which is the yeah. final. It, it's a real exit, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. wherein it's validated by your users. Yeah. Where your users are willing to purchase your uh, exactly. your shares. Yeah. They're willing to invest it again. Uh, that's that's the real validation. Yeah. I mean, successful exit can be different, right? I mean, you made an exit, let's say you invested in an angel round and made an exit at B. Man, it's a successful for you one. I'm definitely not rich. You know why? Because all of the... <laughs> <laughs> and when paper money goes, it's like, at one time, it's like, oh yeah, I'm a fucking billionaire. Oh, uh, shit, uh, uh, not it. anymore. Oh. Yeah. You only really become rich when you actually cash out, right? Yeah, correct. And sometimes it's just not not possible when you're investing. What What do you think about uh, this last question? I believe I think we can. Uh, the reason I'm able to ask these questions to you, to be honest, is because you're bootstrapped. You don't really. Oh, much. Uh, there's not much liability. Uh, money brings in liability. Yeah. So there's not much. So hence, I'll be very, very vocal about what do you think about startups which have recently closed large startups like let's say Lumo, mm -hmm. uh, right? Which was earlier Bukukas. I hear there are a couple of more which are on the world. Mm -hmm. The large ones. Yeah. Look, the small ones keep dying. Yeah. Uh, they haven't hurt people or investors enough to even talk about. But when a large one like book cost no more uh, dies uh, how does it affect the overall ecosystem so i think for us uh we like we like <laughs> I don't know, this sounds yoga we like it that there's a lot more workforce that's available for us to choose okay in this sense but of course uh it affects the sentiment towards startups mm -hmm. towards um companies like you know, like ours as well, like whether we can fully sustain or we're, we, we, whether we can actually survive or not, right? So from, I have not been asked yet by any customer whether 
we're gonna fall or not because there's recently several boot camps that actually fell through right mm-hmm. but we 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 have been just like consistently just chugging along for for us we it's not an issue for us in this case we're not even asking that question but i think um i've had friends who are on the vc side or even on the father side asking me like hey man is this affecting you like on raising and so forth um i told him like it's not I'm not raising, so I'm not, I don't know. I wouldn't know about this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think this was a very refreshing chat. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, anything you feel that we did not discuss and you want to share with our audience? Yeah, I think um, maybe one, one, one parting thing was this whole um, creation of um, AI and, and machine learning skill for amnesia right sure i think um that's a soft pitch yeah that's a soft pitch <laughs> no, no, no. So, <laughs> so, so i think i think there's there is a real need here absolutely i, I was just joking please go yeah, ahead yeah, yeah. i think there's a real need here and and the danger is that like this time we think that okay um if we're going to continue on this path where off of comfort in amnesia back to my original where we're not gonna be the last, we're also not gonna be the first. If we're gonna continue in this path, it's a mindset, to... right? That, that kind of mindset is actually dangerous because this time, it's different, right? Mm. It's 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 automating the intelligence, right? And then like, if, if those things can be automated, then everything else, a lot of the manual work can be automated as well. If those manual work can be automated in manufacturing and the others. How much job are going to be lost? There's going to be societal impact on this, right? Mm-hmm. And if the people are not ready and to move into the knowledge economy faster than the pace right now, mm-hmm. then we're in danger of having a collapsing society in the future, or unstable society in the future, right? Um, one of my favorite authors, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, he speaks a lot about yeah. AI and how it's going to impact humanity. And I was hearing one of his interviews even his books right so he constantly mentions that in the coming years human beings would need to constantly keep reskilling them yeah. maybe every two years yeah so let's say during the under industrial revolution you acquired a skill yeah. you work for it through the life yeah right throughout your life yeah the 20th century it got slightly okay after 15 years if you want to change your career you got to reskill yourself and uh, get into a new career. But this time, it is going to be because of force. Because if you don't reskill yourself, you will not be relevant. Yeah, you're not believe- going to be obsolete. Then what are you going to do? Um, yeah. Um, radicalization, blaming on other things. Oh, yeah. whatever, right? Like, it's, 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 it's already happening uh, somewhere in the... But don't, don't you think it's very difficult for, let's say, someone in his late... 30s or early 40s too. I mean, I'm, I'm already I'm already seeing it in some of my students who are in their late 30s, 40s. So it's just harder for them to to do it. But we sh- we have no choice, man. No choice, right? We have no choice. I mean, look, I think right now with the advent of ChatGPT, all this AI, right? Um, the skills that we need are more on like business acumen and experience. Is still very important. Still very relevant. Mm. But what we really need to understand is we no longer can just base it on our intuition, but we at least, the tools are there. You can use, in the future, I think things are going to be much easier to analyze the data when all this AI helping us with check OT, whatever, to simplify the process of that. Sure. But the, 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 the skill is really needed is the critical thinking and being able to read the data, being able to interpret those and then creating actionables from it, right? That's where the event, the the leverage comes as an individual, the judgment, sure. the judgment and the and 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 the accountability. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I completely agree with you. All right, Chief. Thank you so yeah. much for doing this. Uh, you. you, what is what was your podcast again? I want my. It's, uh, it's our, the Wisdom Archiver. The Wisdom Archivers. It's on Spotify. Spotify. We will include it in the description. So check it out. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, best of luck. Thanks. And see you soon.